Hello, and welcome to Continuing Clockwise, a channel about games, gamers, and gaming. I'm Chad. So this is an exciting day. So we are just a few days after the release of Morden Kanan's Tome of Foes. So today I'm going to talk about whether or not you should buy this book. The wizard strategy since the release of 5th edition has been to release about three hardback books per year. And this is the first release of 2018. If you are a lover of what Wizards of the Coast has been doing lately with their hardback books, and you're really excited for the next release, this is actually a really good book. It's really well put together, and you should buy this book. So who even is Morden Kanan? Those of us who have been in the hobby for a long time will recognize that name. It's been around since at least the 80s, since I remember it first in the first edition Player's Handbook. There are spells named after him. And legend has it that Morden Caden was actually Gary Gygax's wizard character in the very earliest days of the game. The title suggests that a lot of this book is going to be about Morden Caden. And frankly, that's just not true. You know, very similar to Xanathar's Guide to Everything and Volo's Guide to Monsters, what we see of Morden Caden are really just these little inserts into the text. So if you really wanted some background, some history, if you wanted to understand more about Morden Caden as a character, that's not in here, and if that's the reason you are interested in buying this book, don't. About a third of this book is aimed at players and has player content, but the rest is for Dungeon Master. So let's talk about the DMs section first. Half of this book is just monsters. There is a new nightmare on every, on almost every page, and it is frankly awesome. And just like the title, Mordenkainen, a lot of these monsters have roots in the older versions of the game. So there are a lot of content for devils, and there are demons. It's some of that old stuff that contributed to that satanic panic era of uh, during the game that they had to deal with. Now, thinking back to that era where a lot of these monsters are coming from, in my mind, the arch devils were really the true bosses of the game. They were the baddest, the toughest, the scariest things in the first edition AD&D monster manual. And Asmodeus is the baddest of the bad. So he is the top tier arch devil. When this book was announced, I was really excited to see the return of Asmodeus. And guess what? He's in here. There he is. Almost in the first page. So this is very near the front of the book that it really goes into detail about the Lords of the Nine. And so the Lords of the Nine are the, the kind of king arch devils, the worst one. Except almost none of the Lords of the Nine are actually statted up. If you look at the the index here, which actually is way too small for you guys to read, but it's right here in the index, and I poked around to see if it was hidden somewhere, and it's not. They're simply not included. There are not stat blocks for Asmodeus. There's not stat blocks for Beelzebub or Mephist Mephistopheles, or almost all of the Lords of the Nine. So the, the baddest of the bad, the main foes, are not completely in here. So there's some narrative and some really good explanation and some cool stuff but not as monster. And I'm really curious about that design decision or what led them to do that. One of my guesses is that we'll see them in an upcoming release. Maybe an adventure release will be focused on the Lords of the Nine. And an argument could be made that they are so far beyond what uh, an adventuring party would ever be able to face that actually including stat blocks would diminish them somehow. This was something that, that uh, older editions of the game ran into with the Deities and Demigods, right? You, stat, you, know, you put a stat for Odin in there, and now Odin is... is a creature that can be killed. I guess that's another reason why maybe they were excluded, but I don't really buy it, frankly. Orcus is in here, you know, the, the, the main demon lord. So why not the Lords of the Nine? Speaking of Orcus, all of the demon lords are also included. And I'm not very excited about the fact that all of them were already in the Out of the Abyss, which is an, uh, an adventure that I have. It's a good adventure. It's cool stuff. So that's reprinted content, which particularly annoys me with my previous complaint about uh, the absences. Now, the reality is not many adventuring parties would ever get to that level of encountering the Lords of the Nine. Don't let their absence unduly affect your decision to purchase or not purchase this book. So if you want a book that has all the baddest demons and all the cool devils and all their cults and a lot of information and a lot of crazy monsters, yeah, this is probably the book to buy. I just I just thought they, this book was going to knock it out of the park. I wish it had, and it didn't quite. On the other hand, if you already have Out of the Abyss and reprinted material is a not starter, this might not be the book to buy. Now let's talk about the content that was aimed at players. The content here really focuses on, on deep dives on certain races. So it's the, the core races and then the addition of the Gith. So the Gith Zarai and the Gith Yankee. The elf section is really pretty cool. There's a lot of flavor in there and a lot of new options for sub races, such as the Shatter Kai, the Eladrin, and Sea Elves. If you're excited about more options for elves and more background for elves, you should definitely buy this book. 
Similarly, the dwarf section um, isn't quite as robust, but there are stats for playing a Duragar, and there's a lot of other kind of cool content about what dwarves prioritize and what they're about. The chapter on the Gith really fits in well with the theme of the book and is really well done and provides a lot of options for actually uh, for players to play the Gith Yankee or the Gith Sarai. If you're excited about that, you should definitely buy this book. And then there's the chapter on halflings and gnomes, which is not aligned with the theme for the rest of the book. It's almost a palate cleanser, and there aren't additional options for playing a, a halfling. There's a lot of background flavor text. And then the gnome section does have some additional uh, rules for playing a uh, Sferf Neblin. But just like you wouldn't order sushi because you want to eat some ginger, you shouldn't buy Morden Kanan's Tome of Foes for the halfling or the gnome content. And generally, if you're a brand new player to Dungeons & Dragons, don't have a lot of time or energy, but want to invest in something in some of the books, I wouldn't really recommend this one. I would suggest that you buy Xanathar's Guide to Everything after the Player's Handbook. In summary, you probably shouldn't buy this book, if you're really interested in learning more about Morden Kanan, or you just want the stats for the Lords of the Nine, or if you're keenly interested in player options for halflings and gnomes. You should buy this book, however, if you love the other content from Wizards of the Coast. This is a really well put together, well done book with a lot of cool stuff, especially if you're a DM who wants more demons, more devils, more cults, more crazy nightmare inducing stuff to throw at your players. And... You should buy this book if you're a player who's interested in especially elves or the GIF. If you have any questions, let me know in the comments. Also, if you've bought Morden Kanan's Tome of Foes and have other opinions you'd like to offer and talk about, I'd love to hear what you've got to say. Also, let me know if you have other ideas for future videos. So if you enjoyed this, please click the like button and consider subscribing to my channel. And until next week, happy gaming.